Welcome to harmonics to the second class. And then uh, the next class will actually begin to start talking about uh, about batteries. But we want to talk a little more about the harmonics. We talked about the various uh, uh, frequencies of harmonics. We talked last week about uh, how that certain harmonics, and in particular the triplet harmonics, they would add up those harmonic currents in the neutral and cause some problems. Uh, so today we want to talk about uh, the, the types of problems that they can cause. And then we'll also talk about some mitigation techniques as well. And there will be a little bit of review today from, from last week's lesson. So let's go. So let's talk about the effects of harmonics on the electrical system. So there are lots of effects that happen in particular to our electrical equipment, whether it be generators. Uh, typically, these are emergency generators or backup generators for customers, uh, typically not the utility generator that's on the grid. Uh, then we want to talk about the harmonic problems with transformers, uh, which are important to the things that, that we deal with. Uh, we'll talk about harmonics and how that impacts uh, induction motors and how it impacts cables. Uh, circuit breakers, in particular fuses, and the settings on those circuit breakers. And also, we'll talk a little bit about how it impacts the lighting uh, that we deal with as well. So when we start talking about generators, and this is not just a generator issue, but it's also uh, a, a transformer issue as well. Uh, we want to talk a little bit uh, about hysteresis and eddy currents. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, this is not typically a problem with the utility generator, uh, but with backup generators and standalone generators, those sorts of things. So these harmonics can cause increased heating. Uh, heat's always the number one enemy of everything uh, that we deal with in electrical uh, because heat damages the electrical equipment, the insulation. So this heating uh, has a lot to do with iron losses and copper losses, uh, since both of those things are frequency dependent. <clears throat> now, when we talk about these things, these iron losses and copper losses, we'll deal just a little bit about each one of them. Uh, but uh, sometimes equipment has to be derated, and generators may have to be derated, these emergency backup generators. Uh, or the standalone generators. Uh, sometimes transformers have to be derated in order to account for uh, the harmonics on the system. And because of the harmonics, we're going to see not only the heat problem, but there's also going to be some vibration inside that unit as well. Uh, and that vibration is not good either. So we'll talk about that. But basically what we want to talk about is this first term, it's hysteresis loss. Okay. So I have a coil of wire here, and so I have a coil of wire, and then I have this magnetic uh, carrying uh, equipment here. It might be the iron core of a transformer. Uh, it might be the core of, of a generator or a core of a motor. But any time that I have uh, an electromagnetic field that interacts on this coil of wire, that would be a transformer, that could be a generator as well. But as it is interacting with that coil of wire, it's creating more fluxes and, and it's trying to create another voltage across that coil of wire. But it also is in close proximity uh, to this uh, iron uh, core or the core, the magnetic core, and it creates some eddy currents flowing in this core itself. Now, typically we don't get too concerned about eddy currents. And if we look over here at this first diagram, we'll see that this field strength, okay, the field strength, as the field strength increases, we'll see that the flux density in this system, the flux density, that's the flow of the magnetic field, it also increases as well. That's the magnetic flux. And then it will start to crash, and this is all in one cycle, up and down of a sinusoidal waveform. So when we look at that, we are creating the field, and then the field is collapsing. This little area right here, the yellow right here, that is the energy that is released by the, ca uh, the collapse of that field. And that energy is shown up, and it appears in this 
magnetic core. So the more energy released in this magnetic core, the more heat that will build up. And this is frequency dependent. Now we're looking for 60 hertz, and we, when we see the various fundamentals of the various harmonics of that 60 hertz, we will see some increased eddy currents, and those increased eddy currents are not doing anything useful for our system, but they are creating heat in that core. Now, <clears throat> in the transformer, we, sub, we can see increased losses uh, with heat. And it's the same as then that generator, okay? That's, that's exactly what we saw with the generator. We also see increased losses due to copper losses. Uh, basically, I've got my nice sinusoidal waveform flowing through here at 60 hertz, but I've got other garbage floating on there too. That other garbage in the waveform itself may look like this. And this other stuff that's on there, I'm looking for 60 hertz, but this other components that are riding on there is increasing current. That actually creates current because it is a higher voltage. So it increases the current, and when it increases the current, that increases losses. That's copper losses. That's uh, the current flowing through a piece of copper or a piece of resistance. Those are called I squared R losses. Those are watts lost. That is heat, okay? Then the third point when it comes to transformers is that I can build up some resonance between the transformer itself, that winding, and the capacitance of the system. Remember, we're always fighting this inductor capacitive. And when I get to that resonant frequency, which is 1 over 2 pi square root of LC, when I get that resonant frequency, I can have unbelievable current flowing in this little circuit called the tank circuit. I can also have core vibrations trying to uh, uh, dislodge the blocking inside my transformer because the additional uh, uh, vibrations there. And for that reason, we have sometimes uh, installed K-factor transformers. Now, I can remember uh, back in my uh, utility days, which was years and years ago now, but we had some transformers that the transformers uh, would just fail, okay? So those transformers would fail. And we started doing load diagnostics on those transformers, and let's just say we had a 1,000 kVA transformer at 480 volts. So at 1,000 kVA at 480 volts, so I take the 1,000 kVA divided by 480 volts, divided by square root of three, and I can see that that transformer is rated at 1200 amps. Well, we did some analysis and we found out with some load studies and we found out in particular this transformer, uh, the peak load was 1000 amps. So we were under the rating of the transformer, but it failed not once, but it failed twice. Then we got to uh, researching in more detail with a Dranitz uh, meter to try to find out if harmonics were the issue. And we found that we did have a lot of third harmonics on there. And when we were monitoring that 1,000 amps, we were monitoring with a uh, piece of equipment that was just monitoring uh, 60 hertz signal. It wasn't monitoring all those harmonics on there. So even though we only had a thousand amps of 60 hertz on there, when we started adding in the third harmonic, we ended up with about 1700 amps of load on that transformer and therefore it was just heating up. So that was back in the day before K-factor transformers were really, really popular. So we solved the problem by simply installing a 2000 kVA transformer. So I don't know that we actually solved the problem, but the transformer survived. We still had the harmonics on the system. So today they build transformers rated at 1,000 kVA uh, that are built super tough uh, so that they can withstand uh, those extra currents uh, created uh, by the harmonics. In induction motors, <clears throat> I can have iron losses. Guess what? That's what I saw in the generator. I can have copper losses. That's what I just talked about uh, in the, in the uh, uh, transformer. I can actually have extra heat uh, by the rotors uh, uh, due to higher frequencies. Uh, that extra heat causes problems with bearing lubrication. Uh, it actually can create some bearing current. Uh, now they use insulated bearings on variable speed drives but to overcome that. Uh, 
every 10 degrees Celsius increases the loss of life by 50%. So uh, that increased heat really has its toll on induction motors. Now, we talked a little bit last week about various, uh, har various harmonic frequencies and how some of them uh, were positive sequence, some of them were negative sequence. Those positive sequence tend to give you a little better torque. The negative sequence uh, reduces the torque. So that's a problem because if I'm reducing the torque, I still have the standard load, which means now I have to draw more current for that same load, which creates heat. And that zero sequence does absolutely nothing for work. Uh, that's caused by uh, triplin harmonics, if I can spell triplin harmonics, where the sum of the harmonics end up in the neutral and flowing there. That just causes heat alone. Uh, no decrease in torque, no increase in torque, just additional heat, which is a problem on an induction motor. Now on cables, we have I squared losses, I squared R losses. That's again, losses due to resistance, losses due to the current flowing through a, a copper conductor or an aluminum conductor. Uh, I think we've talked in previous classes where if I've got a conductor here, that's cool. It seems like it's really, really thick and strong, but current tends to flow on the outside of that conductor wall. And that's the reason that we have uh, multi-conductor cables, okay? We'll have several small conductors inside that one cable uh, because that gives us more surface area. So that's easier for the current to flow. Well, that skin effect, the desire to go along the outside uh, is really, uh, increased uh, by frequency, okay? So as the frequency increases, I'm actually not conducting anything in the center of this cable, and all of my electrons are flowing near the outside surface of that cable. And so when they're flowing on the near outside surface, that's called a lot of heat in that cable itself. How about circuit breakers and fuses? <clears throat> Most low voltage circuit breakers are thermomagnetic circuit breakers, okay? So they use just a little piece of biometallic trip mechanisms that respond to the heating. So everything inside that thermal magnetic breaker uh, is responding to the heat flowing through that breaker, okay? So if the heat is increased because of these nonlinear loads, uh, then the true RMS value of current will be higher than the current of the same linear load. So I may have a, a linear load that, that's supposed to be uh, pulling uh, 27 amps. Uh, well, I guess it should be pulling less than that, maybe 25 amps for a 30 amp breaker. But with the harmonics on there, it can all of a sudden be pulling 30 amps, creating the heat. And I'll trip the breaker, even though uh, my 60 cycle linear load is underneath what the breaker setting is. Fuses operate off of heat as well. You have to melt that, uh, that little strip inside. So that's going to cause a problem. So the fuses can tend to blow prior to their actual current rating for or the 60 cycle current. In lighting, uh, a slight deviation, 0.25% of voltage, okay? So that would be similar to the total harmonic distortion in the voltage. We talked about that last week. A slight deviation of voltage is perceptible to the human eye. So it's not just the old fashioned light bulbs, but fluorescent bulbs as well. You can see those fluctuations. So I may not damage the light, I may not damage the fixture, uh, but I might be able to see that. But there are other areas that uh, are negative effects with, uh, with harmonics. Power factor correction, okay? So customers install capacitors for the purpose of correcting the power factor. So the whole thing is they've got a power triangle. So they have watts, that's what's doing work. They have volt amperes, that's the voltage times the current, that's there. And then when they have this component called VARS, which is volt amperes reactive. Well, most loads in the world are inductive VARS, okay? So what actually happens is I get a volt, or I get a phase angle shift between the voltage and the current. 
And that angle, the cosine of that angle, is the power factor. So as this cosine of this angle gets lower and lower, means that angle gets bigger and bigger, uh, I'm actually having to increase the amount of volt amperes in order to get the same amount of work done, which is watts. So, and also utilities like to penalize customers if that power factor typically is below like 0.9, some of them are 0.88, so like an 88% power factor, uh, the utility may start charging the customer a penalty charge each month. So the customer will install a capacitor bank. So here's a story, Methodist Hospital, they installed to uh, install a capacitor bank to correct their power factor correction. So they have this large transformer outside, okay? Inside the building, they have these large chillers, many of them, large, 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 which are nothing more than inductors. So they install this very large capacitor bank out here in order to correct that. So the system now looks like this. Well, what they did was they set up a resonant circuit between the inductance of those chillers and the power factor correction. No increased load coming out of the utility, but unbelievable current flowing in this little circuit. Half the cycle, the chillers supplying uh, VARs back to the capacitor, the other half cycle, VARs are being going the other way. Bottom line is they started blowing capacitors and at one point, they actually had to call the fire department because the capacitor bank was on fire. So setting up that resonant circuit can be a horrible situation. Power cables, <clears throat> electromagnetic interference, okay, interference uh, next to uh, control cables. So I can have a lot of garbage riding on my 60 cycles. And if it's next to cables that are TV or communications or radio or control systems, I can cause some interference there. Telemetry. When I want to read watts, bars, power factor, voltage, current, those sorts of things, it may not be accurate unless I have truly, true, true RMS uh, metering. And conventional meters, they're, they're designed to read sinusoidal-based quantities, okay? So if it's not sinusoidal, there's going to be errors involved. So those are some just other negative effects uh, that can call, can, that can happen uh, due to harmonics on the system. Okay, IEEE put out a guide, IEEE 519. It's been uh, revised a couple, three times, and it covers some things about how to maintain this and how to try to reduce harmonics on the system. But it also talks about uh, what to look out for. So let's look first of all. So a plant, a factory is expanding and uh, they have to add a significant number of nonlinear loads. And so you may ask us like, why would they want to add uh, the nonlinear loads if you know that that's going to be a problem? Well, you add the nonlinear loads because you need variable frequency drives. I need the ability to change the speed of the motors that I'm operating inside this facility. That, that causes, that, that requires a non-linear load. So when you go out for bids for that variable frequency drive, uh, the engineering staff typically uh, don't have the option to overturn the bids. So bottom line is when uh, uh, suppliers come in with the bids, uh, the financial aspect of the firm says we'll take low bid and that low bid uh, typically does not have a filter to filter harm the harmonics that's created by that drive uh, if they added that filter then they would no longer be low bid because other people are there uh, we actually had a situation I had a situation I went out to a medical center when they had where they had an MRI machine uh, that was causing a lot of problems on their medical system in this little uh, uh, walk-in clinic type place and when I did some analyzing we found out there's horrible horrible harmonics on coming off this MRI and they asked what I should do I said you ought to call the manufacturer contact the manufacturer this is not the first time they've seen this and when they called the manufacturer in fact the manufacturer had a filter that was designed in particular for that specific piece of equipment, but it wasn't included in the bid because they would not have been low bid. 
We already talked a little bit about power factor correction capacitors or power factor capacitor banks uh, on, a in, on a line or a line harmonic filter. Uh, if you add these uh, at the service entrance or in the vicinity of the service entrance, there is a large short circuit capability at that point. And we'll look a little bit at some equations here in a minute. Uh, but you can get into real problems, and it's that resonant frequency thing again I talked about like we had at Methodist Hospital. If you have a generator and it's added to the plant as an alternate standby source, uh, there can be problems because generators can heat up a lot quicker because of the harmonics on the system and the utility company, uh, you're not going to damage their equipment because it's a pretty robust system. And then finally, the utility company, they can start imposing uh, limits to you on harmonic injection. Uh, the facility uh, that is down in uh, uh, the nuclear facility uh, in Alabama has a separate yard that the uh, utility was really concerned. It's, it's a backup yard. Utility was really concerned because they didn't have the proper filtering on that, that it would be a, a problem on their grid, even though they were uh, serving the grid at 500 kV. So there had to be uh, some remediation there. Now, there are several ways to consider mitigating the harmonics, okay? The first thing I'm going to mention here is delta y, del delta 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 y transformers. Okay, now this whole idea of harmonic mitigation uh, is called phase shifting. So if we look at phase shifting, there are three in particular that we want to look at: 60 degrees, 30 degrees, and 15 degrees. And there's a lot of math that goes in here that we're not going to do. But the 60 degrees phase shifting, uh, that tends to cancel third harmonics. Uh, this 30 degree phase shifting tends to cancel fifth and seventh harmonics. And the 15 degrees tends to cancel out 11th and, 15, and 13th. So if I can get a phase shift, I can cancel out certain harmonics. And one of the easy ones to cancel out is this 30 degrees phase shift. If we can remember right, if I have a delta Y transformer, that there's actually a 30 degrees phase shift between this voltage right here, because A and B, the voltage AB is up here at 30 degrees. So there's actually a 30 degrees phase shift there. So one tool that you can use, let's just say that you're going to have a couple of variable speed drives that you're going to install that are pretty good size. VFDs, VFDs. And then here's my utility coming in. One way that's very effective is I can install a transformer here to feed this drive and it's delta delta. There's no phase shift there. And then I can supply a transformer here to feed this one and I can connect it delta Y. So there's zero degrees phase angle shift there. There's 30 degrees phase angle shift here. They tend to cancel each other out. And so the fifth and seventh harmonic would be greatly reduced in that case. So that's one thing that we can do that can really, really help us out. But that's not the only thing that we can do. We can look at isolation transformers. So isolation transformers, there's the symbol of the isolation transformer. I can actually see that if I have a drive isolation transformer, uh, this is for AC, I'm sorry about the blur, that's AC. I can see the incoming waveform that's going into this drive. And I can see that when I add this insul isolation transformer, that I can see it's not perfect, but it really cleaned it up. And DC drives are even uh, more significant for the harmonics that they create, but that isolation transformer 
can again not make it a pure sine wave there's still a little bit of harmonics there but it's pretty effective in reducing it's the it's the best way uh, to make an immediate change uh, if you have SCR silicone controlled rectifiers as part of your bridge rectifier circuit so if you see these devices these are SCRs if I can find my pen there those are SCRs see the little place that fires there they're really effective there not a bad way to approach it. Other methods of harmonic mitigation, reactors, okay? I can put a line reactor right here, and if I look at the line reactor, and there's my VFD, variable frequency drive, and then I've got some output load there, okay? I can put a line reactor there, and remember, the reactance changes with frequency. As frequency goes up, this impedance goes up. So as the frequency increases, this is a larger impedance, so it doesn't want to go through that impedance because it gets very large as the frequency increases. So it's a linear relationship right here, so I can really impact that. Uh, notice also that when it comes to a line reactor, which is nothing more than an inductor, that, you know what, the current cannot change instantaneously so it doesn't amount I'll permit an instantaneous change in current I can really make it if I size that reactor right I want to make it very low impedance for 60 cycles but for the harmonics that I'm dealing with maybe fifth or seventh I may want to make it very high impedance for those so I can size that using this equation again a little bit of calculus here but the voltage across that is the inductance in Henry's times the change in current over the change in time. So it's, it's a calculation uh, using calculus for that. The bottom line is the higher the frequency, the larger the impedance, and it won't let it go through. Pretty cost effective, pretty simple on an individual VFD basis. And this is one where the manufacturer can provide it, and they don't typically do it because they want to be low bid. So there are other ways. Newcore Steel in Crawfordsville's figured out a way. They've got a filter yard. They've got a trap. They've got a series circuit. Here's an inductor in series with a capacitor. The same here. Inductor in series with a capacitor. This one's tuned for 300 hertz, which is what? Fifth harmonic. So the fifth harmonic, if there's fifth harmonic on the electrical system, it wants to go here because that's pretty close to zero impedance. And it will leave and not go on the rest of the system and not back out to the utility. This one's set up for the seventh harmonic. This one's set up for the third harmonic. So third, fifth, and seventh harmonic, they're filtering those current frequencies directly to ground and trying to keep it off the rest of the system, and certainly trying to keep it off the utility so that they don't get dinged for additional charges there. Now, there are some equations, okay? Bottom line is, uh, the larger the transformer, the larger the capacitance we've got to worry about. There is an equation that says the harmonic resonance the harmonic resonance, this will be in like third, fifth, seventh, or ninth, or something like that, is closely related to the KVA, and that's short circuit KVA. That's not the KVA of the transformer, that's a short circuit KVA provided by the utility, divided by the KVAR of your capacitor bank. So let's just take, for instance, that I found out from the utility that their short circuit is 30,000 amps. 30,000 kVA, okay, sorry, not 30,000 amps, 30,000 kVA. And I have added 3,000 kVAR of capacitor. So let's do the equation. 30,000 over 3,000. And so the square root of that is about 11, okay? No, that's sorry, that's three. Is about three. So basically, the third harmonic would set up a resonant frequency for this size capacitor. Now, if I were to reduce that capacitor down to simply a thousand, 
uh, it would be the square root of 30,000 kVA short circuit down to 1,000 kVar of capacitance. Uh, then my harmonic resonant frequency would be the 11th harmonic. So there are some basic calculations that we can do that can help resolve some of those issues. But typically, the closer you try to get, the closer you try to get to unity or a power factor equal to 100%, the more likely you are to have those harmonic resonances down in the lower frequencies where you don't want them. Now, there are some newer systems to work on harmonics, okay? It's called an active filter. So it's very, very expensive, but very, very effective. And basically, I've got my source here. There's my nonlinear load. I've got some inductance here, but I've got an active filter. And so what it does, it actually monitors what's going on right there. Uh, that's poor English, what's going on in the line. And it will inject whatever frequency is required to get rid of the harmonics. Again, pretty expensive, relatively new equipment. Uh, most people can't afford to utilize that. There are other ways. When they first started coming out with energy efficient systems, uh, they started using what is called a six pulse uh, device. So I've got my three phases, one, two, three. And on each phase, I have two diodes, silicone control rectifiers. I see the little uh, gate right there to turn each one on. So if I look at this, I've got two per phase, three phases, so that is six pulses. Pretty inexpensive in order for me to come out with DC. I've got that. Over here, I have 12 pulse. I've got the same thing, uh, but I've got a three winding transformer. And now I've done that phase shift thing. Okay, I got a delta delta, delta y, 30 degrees phase shift. And then I have two six pulse rectifiers on each side. And then I can come up with even a higher uh, level uh, of rectification, 18 pulse, uh, where I have three phases to nine phases. So I'll convert it three different ways. And then I'll have 18 different pulses. I get a very smooth waveform out here. But the bottom line is every time I increase the number of pulses, I've got some phase shifts there. And remember, those phase shifting help to reduce certain harmonics. So here I would have 30 and uh, 60 degrees phase shift. So that's going to take care of the harmonics from uh, third, fifth, and seventh harmonics. And typically those are the ones that really harm me. Now, if I look at design impacts. Last slide for the day, looking at design impacts. If I look at a six pulse rectifier, okay, six pulses, typically what we used to have, uh, without the line reactor, uh, I've got 80% harmonic distortion with respect to current uh, on the fifth. Seventh is 58%, 11th is 18%. You can see it continuing to decrease, but the total harmonic distortion on that drive is 101%. Now, I can really improve that just by adding a line reactor, 2 to 3% line reactor. Cut the fifth harmonic in half, uh, cut the seventh harmonic dramatically, and basically just got rid of everything else, and the total harmonic distortion is 43.6. If I use a 5% reactor, I can increase it even further. If I use a harmonic filter, which is going to be a reactor and capacitor both, I can get it down to 4.9%. Now, if I go to the 12 pulse, which uses the 30 degrees phase shift, the delta, delta, delta Y, and then uh, 12 different SCRs, you can see, wow, I've really reduced it down to 8.8%. And if I remember right, I have to worry about how much of my load is causing harmonics and compare that over the whole system. But look, if I install an 18 pulse rectifier, uh, which means I've really done some things with phase shifting up front and I have a lot of silicon control rectifiers to fire to make pure DC, look what happened to my harmonics. The front end, they went down to virtually nothing. I still have a little bit of 17th and 19th, but I tell you, 
17th to 19th harmonic is typically not a problem on an electrical system, but the overall total harmonic distortion is less than 5%, that's 3.9%. And I'm telling you, you could run an entire factory. If everything in that factory was less than 10%, you'd be total, you'd be fine. So this is the ultimate solution uh, to the problem. All right, so that is the lecture for today. Next week, we're going to uh, go and we'll start talking about uh, uh, battery systems. I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you then. And please remember to send me an email telling me that you watched this video.